Good evening. Uh, I'm Brock McKay, licensed psychologist, and this is part two on the uh, the aspects of the heart in relation to the emotions and the emotions in relation to the heart in scripture. We talked last time about just how significant it is that we're built in the image of God, made in his image, and from the get-go we see that God has this capacity for deep, deep emotional experiences, which is part of what he's also built into us. Uh, I mentioned frequently that there is 1,400 human emotions, and we don't experience those all at once, which is probably good, and that the variability that comes into the emotional expression, emotional experience, has more to do with the intensity of the emotional experiences, so we can have mild, moderate, or strong emotions, and the characteristic about those tends to be that the stronger the emotion, the more important, the more significant these things are to us. <coughs> I talked last time specifically about uh, how the, uh, the the Greek orientation prioritizes reason and rational thought over the emotional experience, and that that's really affected the North American church and the way that we generally function uh, as believers in North America, particularly in relation to the emotional component. <coughs> Excuse me. And the story is that, or the, 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 the common approach is that the emotions are not to be trusted. They're not reliable. Um, they will lead you astray. They are distorting things. They're legitimate for children to have, but not for us as adults. Uh, they're more likely within the culture also to be seen uh, relegated to the back burner. They're more likely to be set aside or seen as the domain of women, which is a horrendous, horrendous uh, abuse of how we're made as human beings. I believe that most men are just as just as sensitive and can be wounded just as deeply as women. It's just that we generally, most men are trained away from having that kind of experience or that rapport with our emotional experience. So when we talked about it before, <clears throat> I wanted us to have the understanding of just the role that the emotions are supposed to be able to play. And I drew out the, the linear understanding of the way that the Greeks tended to look at things with body soul and spirit and they tended to lay it out in this fashion <clears throat> with the emotions being listed under the mind will and emotions and that tends to truncate it tends to divide us up it also tends to separate us from the things that the Greek orientation tends to put emphasis on, which is the things of the spirit. The problem with that is that's not the way the scriptures represent us, but that is the way the tripartite view of man is part of the, the I think, the, the legacy of sort of the Greek view of things, which places a tremendous amount of emphasis on, on belief and knowing at, at the intellectual level and way less emphasis on the actual experience or the walking things out in relation to a heart uh, the heart, uh, the heart, and its um, capacities and its emotional, fundamental emotional nature. The more accurate view, rather than it being linear and being sort of separated out here, with this being sort of the negative side or the bad side, and this being the part that Jesus has illuminated, which is the good side. <clears throat> this is the part that he's awakened. The flip side that's there, I think, that is that is a better pr perspective is much, much more the way that the Hebrews were to look at things. And they tended to look still with the body, soul, and spirit. But the body was here, the soul was here, and the spirit was here, and the heart was kind of at the core, right, in the middle. So the advantage with this is it means that the heart is going to relate. It is, it is foundational and fundamental to the, the, the fundamental core of who we are. Now, part of how this has been, this has been, uh, provocative for us is that the emphasis has not been on the heart within much of Christianity and the Christianity that we have known because, again, the Greek orientation has not been so much around the emotional experience, the relational experience with God. It's been much more heavily based or weighted on on the thinking and the right theology at the right perspective, the, the correct way of viewing things. So it's more knowledge acquisition than it is knowledge of God. And that's gotten us into trouble. It, make, it means, to some extent, when difficult trials come, we go back to the parable of the soils, and there are difficult challenges and trials come because there isn't that sense of connection with God at the emotional, at the heart level. Then when difficulties come, well, there is a, a, an abdication or a, a, an abandoning of the faith um, because the core has never actually necessarily been touched. <clears throat> 
One of the ways you can think about the, uh, how, the, how the emotional experience is supposed to work for us is looking at what the brain does. The brain is functioning this way. This is the, the frontal lobe. This is where all our, uh, our attention and concentration and judgment and decision making and um, processing. This is where our evaluation and logic and reasoning and analysis and inhibition um, and planning all are based in, all these things are known as the executive functions and they're all based in the frontal lobe. This is where they are. The emotions are at the core of the center of the brain and they are supposed to contribute information up to, because remember, if we're talking about the emotions, my terrible handwriting, the emotions are data. They're really important data. They're really, really significant data for us. And if we think about the way the brain is supposed to work, then the emotions contribute information up to the frontal lobe so that uh, it, along with history and memory, and learning and situational factors and social awareness, all these particular kinds of things get funneled to the frontal lobe. And all this gets stirred around, figuratively speaking, in the pot of our intellect. And we engage our attention and our concentration and our judgment and decision making and our evaluative processes and our logic and reasoning. But the goal in the ideal set of circumstances is that the emotions are part of the source of information so that we can make the very best decisions and exercise really good judgment. And if logically, if my heart is knit together, knitted together with the Lord Jesus, by definition, just it, it can't help but be that my decisions are gonna be made differently. My sense of judgment is gonna be made differently. <clears throat> when we, we look at and we capture what it is that the kingdom is like, the kingdom itself is in many cases is upside down from what we normally have in the world. The last will be first, okay? And the poor have the gospel shared, to, shared with them and, and they are rich in the kingdom. Uh, the man who loses his life for my sake will find it. Um, it's kind of like, these things don't make any sense at the logical, planar level because the kingdom of heaven isn't based on sense. It's based on relationship. It's based on connection with God. So when we understand that this is the dynamic, if this part is shunned, if it's shut down, if it's not engaged, if the emotions are not allowed to, to contribute their role, then anything that happens at the decision or the judgment level, using our attention and our concentration and our reasoning and all these other particular capacities, is going to be affected. We will be humanly less human in some respects and certainly less effective if the data and the information from our emotional center is not integrated into the process. This is actually a huge, huge, huge deal. And so in some respects, it means, again, the emphasis can be on knowing things, knowing and understanding things rather than having the experience with God. So we can collect our knowledge. Some people are incredibly, incredibly knowledgeable of what the scriptures say. But as the scriptures say, these people obey me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Okay. We confess with our mouth, but we believe with our heart. That's because it's the core. So I can have my mind go in the direction of the things of the kingdom, and I can think it through. But if my heart doesn't go there, then only part of me is involved. Generally, if my heart is involved in a process, my brain is with me. My thinking is with me. <clears throat> The other round isn't necessarily the case, okay? So we definitely have this set of circumstances here. And the reason why the emotions are so important in the mix is because the emotions function largely like, an, like a compass. Oops. <laughs> well, don't take me on the trip. Okay. Having the emotional experience but not necessarily being able to track it or not being able to understand it, not have respect for it, not engage with it, um, is like having a compass that has no needle. The emotions are there, the directions are there, but what we know beyond a shadow of a doubt is this, if I'm lost in the forest or I'm lost in the desert, this compass is completely useless for me. 
I, I, the directions are there, the emotions are there, but they can't help me. If I don't track with the emotional experience, then I don't know, that I'm not gonna know what information they're contributing and how they clarify things for me. If we put that small bit of needle on here and we actually end up tracking, that needle, which is the ability to be able to track and know and understand what we're experiencing at the emotional level. And I think that's something that we do throughout our lives. I think we get better at knowing and understanding. It's not something, even, even though in my training as a psychologist, I'm, I'm good and skilled at being able to identify these things in other people. It's still a challenge sometimes to be able to define specifically what the emotional experience is. The more accuracy that I have when I define that emotional experience, the more I get to understand the meaning and the significance of why I feel that way in this particular situation. Why is it that my heart is drawn to some people? And why is it that the hairs on the back of my neck go up with others? It's kind of like, that's a really important distinction to be making. There's, there's something, I'm having some kind of emotional response to this individual that causes me to be fearful and careful around them. Okay, if I ignore that experience, then my judgment and decision-making are literally going to be impaired and I am likely to put myself in peril because I'm ignoring that emotional input. Okay, so with this, the emotions now get to play their role and I would suggest that one of the ways we think about the emotional experience for us is it is a way of us being able to get our bearings. So we won't know what we actually think and feel and won't necessarily know what our best course of action is going to be if we're not paying attention to the emotional component. That's just, that's how we're built. It's why they're built in. It's one of the reasons why when we take a look in the scriptures and we look at what moves God's heart, when in the old covenant was he upset? He was upset when, when the people whom he loved and cared about and he placed himself within them to be represented by them when they would grumble, when they would complain, when they would back away, when they would chase after other gods. Excuse me, Solomon, who has, who has asked for wisdom. God grants him wisdom and God grants him long life and grants him all these things. And then Solomon, over the course of his life, absolutely gets derailed. And he's doing inappropriate things left, right, and center. What happened? What, what the scriptures say, you know, do not, do not marry outside the faith. Don't marry those and the people around you because they're, because the daughters of the kings will steal your heart and move your loyalty away from me. That's exactly what happened with him. Precisely what happened. Okay, so the heart ends up being this really key, key, significant component in the mix. It's informed by the emotional experience. And in some respects, it does represent that key core component that is just so relevant to how we look at things. <clears throat> and it's relevant to decision making. and It's relevant to how we establish our lives. There is nothing more significant in our lives than the relationships we have. More significant than work, more significant than, than our positions, more significant than the capacities and the things that we do. There is nothing more significant than the relationships that we have in our lives. Critically, the relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus and the relationship we have with those others around us, those that are believers, those are family members, those that are outside the faith, um, all those things, there is, all those relationships, there's nothing more important than the relationships. And for us to have our hearts involved in the relationship critically, informed by understanding what's going on at the emotional level, helps us understand what we're doing and how we're posturing ourselves in relation to the people around us. Sarah Groves, in one of her well-written songs, makes the comment, in the end, your relationships are all you've got. And she's absolutely right. And what makes relationships significant is the emotional intensity that's involved with them. There are some people that we are friends with. Jesus had the 70, and he also had the 12, and he also had the three. So even in Jesus' own ministry, in his own life, in his own experience, he had those that were close to him. And it wasn't just that he wanted them to see sort of the inner workings. Jesus' love and affection for them was, was specific and special. He had a special relationship with James and Peter and John. And he loved the other nine, including Judas, by the way. Okay, so 
One of the things I think we end up having to contend with in this process of looking at how the emotions all fit in is the awareness that within the Western orientation, there are certain sort of classic evangelical stances that are taken that drive me nuts. And they are, and they are sort of swallowed hook, line, and sinker because they are part of the culture that we are in. And we don't have necessarily that objectivity to be able to recognize this is a culturally determined thing. This isn't what the scriptures necessarily teach, but it's what the, what the Christian culture has dictated. And I cannot tell you the number of individuals that I've come across who will look at passages of scripture, such as what we see in Jeremiah 17. And this is their general response. Jeremiah 17 where God is clearly speaking through Jeremiah, and Jeremiah, <laughs> excuse me, just says, I'm all thumbs here, by the way. He just says, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick or desperately wicked. Who can understand it? Who can cure it? And I've heard individuals say that out of hand as a reason and a rationale for dismissing the emotional component, okay? What we also obviously have to be careful of is when we look at the scriptures to make sure that we're not proof texting. This serves that individual's goal of saying the emotions get to be set aside because they're just not particularly important, okay? The reality is they're essential. They're part of how God himself expresses himself and how he has made us and we're in his image. And so the emotional component is critically important to us. So when it says the heart is deceitfully wicked above all else, desperately sick, who can understand it? If we just look at that portion of scripture and lift it out, then it serves our purpose of making sure that we get to set aside the emotional experience, which is a consistent stance within evangelical Christianity. Remember, the goal is to understand things. The goal is to think things well. The goal isn't to necessarily have the passion and the intensity of love and affection. The goal is to get the thinking right. That's, that, that's a Greek orientation, and it is not the biblical orientation. But what's interesting, if you take a look at this passage, the reason why this is being said, the Lord is speaking this way to Jeremiah, is because... The Israelites have just broken two of the most significant of the Ten Commandments. They're chasing after other gods, and they've made graven images. It's kind of like, well, maybe that's got something to do with the context here. And if we don't get the context, then we don't understand why God is asserting that the heart is so wicked. Well, the heart is wicked if it's worshiping other gods and other idols. It's kind of like, that's a big, big deal for the people of God to be doing because it's, they are, their hearts are walking away from their God. So we know, and I've heard people say this. I've heard people say this. I've heard people also use other portions of scripture where they say, um, out of the new covenant, <clears throat> um, and they will quote Paul, forgetting everything that lies behind, we press on for the goal. And it's frequently, look, I've got these things in my past and my history that have been really painful and really problematic for me. And the response is, forgetting what lies behind, just press on to the goal. It's not that big a deal, don't worry about it. And what that does is dismiss this, oops, it dismisses the significance of a person's emotional experience. So I have a, an unresolved issue with somebody and I go to them and their response is, uh, let's just, well, well forgive me because I, I messed that up. I, no, 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 no. There has to be some accounting of some understanding of what's actually transpired, what the wounding has been in order to really be able to offer forgiveness. Now, the key thing about this is I don't necessarily have to have that conversation with that individual in order for me and my heart to forgive them. And I think that's a critical component. It also doesn't mean that if I've forgiven that individual that all, everything's now, everything's covered and I can now hang out with them. It's kind of like, it doesn't mean that at all. Because the forgiveness that I offer them actually is not to free them up, it's to free me up in my heart. Because my heart is the one that's bearing the pain, the wounding. So I actually have, and this is what Jesus says, you know, if you don't forgive your brother from your heart, uh, then your heavenly father won't forgive you. It's kind of like, my thinking is that's in that particular area. I may be wrong about that. What I do know though is that literally getting down to my heart because forgiveness doesn't take place in my head. Forgiveness takes place in my heart. And for me to forgive a brother, to let a brother go, to, to no longer hold 
that against them, that fundamentally is a heart process. I also believe it's a godly process. I also believe it's something that I really have to have the Holy Spirit's involvement with. And I have to have my heart knit with the Holy Spirit within me to be able to do that and do that well. So what happening with that in that situation is that the emotions play this really significant role because it hurts. It's, it's difficult to go through the process of actually forgiving somebody when they wounded us. That's not an easy thing to do. And particularly if the wounding was repeated, repetitive, if it was a process rather than an incident, there's, there's, there, there are multiple aspects to that level of forgiveness that has to take place. And when somebody says, let's just forgetting what lies behind and, and let's press on. If we take a look at that portion of scripture where Paul is saying that, again, the context becomes this really important thing, just as it does in that, just as it does in that portion of Jeremiah. The context of Paul saying that is him trotting out his pedigree. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews and he was circumcised on the eighth day and he was studying in the scriptures and the scrolls and he knew everything and da, da, da. And he's saying, none of that matters. I'm, I'm willing to set all my history that I used to boast in. I'm willing to set that aside to pursue what is really true, which is the, the going after Christ Jesus. And the goal with that is not to dismiss the significance of anything to do with the emotions. If we look at the context, we, we cannot proof text that. If we look at the context, it's Paul saying, I haven't got anything to boast in in my history. The only thing I've got to boast in is my Lord, and that's who I'm after. When individuals use the scriptures inappropriately and don't look at the context, then I think they miss out on the significance of the role that the emotions are supposed to play. And it's just, it's more convenient to be able to set that stuff aside. The emotions can be messy. Life is messy. Relationships are messy. There's nothing more complex than relationships. But that's, this, is, this is the arena where the kingdom of God is fleshed out. This is why it is so, so, so important for us to know and truly understand how, the, how my relationship with the Lord Jesus is, is based on and determined by what's going on in my heart, which means my relationship with him should be emotional. It had better be. It had better be emotional. Because if it's just head knowledge, it's kind of like, I don't know what my chances are if it's just head knowledge. Now, I'm glad the Lord Jesus is able to sort the stuff and figure this stuff out. I'm glad he's able to do that. But if it's just head knowledge, I don't know where I stand with my king. I know he's gracious and I know mercy triumphs over judgment. I just know that if my heart isn't involved, if my heart isn't going after him, if I'm not moved emotionally to engage emotionally with the King of Kings and my, and my Lord, then I don't know that I can actually call myself an active, uh, believing believer. Okay. So, there's this interesting dynamic that takes place within much of the Christianity that I've been exposed to, and I've been exposed to it in Canada and Southern California and in Texas and, and certainly here in Kansas. Um, <clears throat> it is not at all unusual because the emotions are not well taught. Are not, then we don't get much instruction or much training or in discipleship in what, what the role the emotions are particularly supposed to play that in many cases, what I see is individuals who know the scriptures well enough to know that they have sinned. And the response where the emotions begin to come in is almost the requirement that they go through some level of remorse and that they feel bad. That somehow that is the role that the emotions are supposed to play when we sin and when we screw stuff up, when we make mistakes. And so if I am busy feeling guilty and feeling like a bad person, which is not biblical, okay, I'm not a bad person because I sin. I am I'm dearly, intensely loved by the Lord Jesus, and I've sinned. And he has covered that with his blood, and I am to ask forgiveness for that. And, and his his interest in me, his love and affection for me, is not in any way affected by my sin, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a head scratcher because no other relationship in our lives is like that. So if, if we know and understand that, that my sin is something that more than likely is going to interfere with my relationship with him, how I feel before him, how I feel in relation to him, 
that's something that, that is, is problematic in that it's interfering with my ability to have a clean, wide open relationship with my Lord. And in most situations and circumstances, again, thinking about that, the Greek dualism, that the sense of body and soul and, and the badness is there, there is that sense in which when I sin, I am bad and God doesn't approve of me, when that's actually not what the biblical text dictates. He's, he's never, Jesus was never particularly distressed about us being human. And I think we have, in, in evangelical Christianity, I think we have more of an emphasis or more of a comfort level with Jesus being the Son of God than we do with him being the Son of Man. I think we're more uncomfortable with him being just like us. And if God was so distressed and so objection, uh, 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 if he found man so objectionable, then he never, ever, ever would have sent his Son to become a man like us. He wouldn't have done that. I don't think Jesus is uptight about us being human and, and making mistakes and falling short of the glory of God. He does, we're not bad because we're sinners. We're not bad to begin with. And do we sin? Yes. And is that a problem we got to take care of? Yes, before I become a believer, at the point I become a believer, and the rest of my days as a believer. But my identity is no longer as a sinner saved by grace. I believe that's what happened at the point at which I came to the kingdom. At the point at which I became a believer is when I became a sinner saved by grace. From then on, my identity has shifted and changed. And my identity is as a son of God, as a child of the king, an ambassador of Christ Jesus. I am a, rec uh, a minister of reconciliation. I'm a carrier of the kingdom. I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. None of that has anything to do with an identity as a sinner saved by grace. I think that is swallowed up in, in the, the event of my becoming a believer, and then my identity changes, which frees me up to be able to experience, from my perspective, tons and tons more in the emotional realm. So I think that the emotions largely in evangelicalism have ended up being usurped by the whole concept of, of guilt and remorse when I screw something up. And then I'm supposed to carry that for a period of time. And I don't, I don't actually know what the length of time is. I guess it depends on the sin. If the sin's worse, I'm supposed to carry that longer. Um, but there's the sense in which that's almost like that's the relegation or the role that the emotions are supposed to play. I'm supposed to feel bad about my sin. The Hebrews didn't look at it that way. That's a very much a Greek orientation. The, the Hebrews looked at it from the point of view of, I need to do something different. I acknowledge, yes, I've screwed up, this is wrong, I, I, I seek forgiveness, and I, I change my behavior and I move forward. Nothing changed for the Hebrews, that sense of acceptance, that fundamental acceptance that they had. Nothing changed that. So even when they sinned, nothing changed that. There's much more of a conditional character and nature within evangelical Christianity that we can screw this up and God's going to disapprove of us. He doesn't disapprove of us. When the Father looks at you and me, he sees his Son. And he's incredibly pleased with his Son. And we are in him, never to be taken out of him. We are in him, in Christ Jesus. So what that does is it changes it changes and confirms our heart. All of us from the time we were born have wanted a sense of belonging. We've always wanted a sense of inclusion. We want to know that we're valuable. We want to know that we're important. We want to know that our lives matter. It's one of the reasons why every, each one of us is so, so different is that we all matter to the Lord. All 7.5 billion of us on the planet and all the millions that have come before us, everyone has mattered and does matter uniquely to the Lord Jesus and to the Heavenly Father. All of us are known intimately by him, and we all have the opportunity of this relationship, this individual relationship with him. All of us have that. So what the scriptures say, you know, God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son. And <clears throat> not everybody reaches out and takes the prize. Not everybody reaches out and comes to peace with God, but that doesn't mean that the coverage wasn't there. That doesn't mean that God's love for people isn't there. It's all the way through it. It's all the way through the scriptures. And when we see that portion of scripture in, in 1 Peter, uh, when he says, we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, the people are calling on God's own name, 
He's quoting something from Deuteronomy. That was in the heart of God at the very beginning. That's how he related to the Hebrews. That's always been his, that's always been how he's looked at us. And the church, we are grafted in. Israel still is the apple of his eye and he's still, he has not finished with Israel in any way. And we have had the privilege of being grafted in and included in the process. We are the Gentiles all the way through the book of Luke. The Gentiles are mentioned. And this is what we are. We are grafted in. So what I want you to think about is the reason why when we come up against some of those, some of those passages of Scripture that are used as proof texts against things, I want to use as an example what's really interesting in um, 1 Corinthians 11. And I think, again, this pertains specifically to what I have been familiar with in my experiences of North American Christianity. When it comes time to communion, to taking the elements, it's interesting to me that in general, the portion of scripture that is looked at and that is gone to and that is isolated is the portion in 1 Corinthians 11 where Paul is, is speaking to the Corinthians about them getting in fist fights over communion. I mean, it's like, I don't know when the last time was you went somewhere, what kind of church you went to, and there were fist fights over communion. It's been a while for me. And, and so when Paul gets to that it's imperative and important for us to examine ourselves so that we don't drink judgment unto ourselves, that's the portion of Scripture that is, that is teased out, and that's the one portion of Scripture that is frequently read out over communion. Now, if we don't look at the context and don't understand that Paul is livid, with the Corinthians at this point in time because of what they're doing. That, that word, that phrase, that message is not meant for us because we're not having a punch up over the wine and the bread. He's specifically contextually identifying this was a problem that they were having. And that's the context for that because we look back at the gospels and what does Jesus say? This is the new covenant in my blood. This is my body given for you, not broken, given for you. Take these in remembrance of me. So when I read through the Gospels and I see the communion story, I am reminded of what Jesus has done. When I, when I fall prey to the inappropriate use and the contextual misuse of that portion in Corinthians, I'm at the communion table, and what am I thinking about? My sin. I'm, I'm making sure that I'm not taking the communion in some unworthy fashion. And it's about my sin. And I've completely lost sight of Lord Jesus with what he said. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the new covenant in my blood. Okay, I know that's off topic a little bit, but I think it's an important dynamic. We absolutely have to look at the portion of scripture and where we find these things to be able to get the context. And in Proverbs 4, where it says, guard your heart, protect your heart, because out of it come the wellsprings of life. That whole passage and all that portion is looking at how to live our lives wisely. And it is just simply wise to protect our hearts, to be careful with our hearts. We don't just give them away to anybody or any set of circumstances. We have to guard our heart because out of it come the things that are significant and that matter in my life. That's part of the reason why that's such a big deal and such a, such a huge, huge deal. Now, if we're going to take a look at the emotional experience, the emotions, I should say, in relation to our lives and our walking out as believers, we only need to take a look at the King of Kings, at the Lord Jesus himself walking amongst us as a man, fully human, completely human, with his Godhead veiled, I used to think that Jesus did the miracles because out of his godness. But Philippians 2 says that's not the case. He manifests these things because of the spirit of God in him, which is the same spirit that's in me and the same spirit who is in you. And so by rights, this is why Jesus says, greater things shall we, shall we do who come after him than he has done. Because the same spirit who was doing, the Holy Spirit who was doing these manifestations of God's kingdom everywhere Jesus went, it's the same spirit who is within us, and we have the freedom, hopefully in our connection, our relationship with the Lord, to give the Holy Spirit the freedom to move and do these very things. But we absolutely have to take a look at the Lord Jesus if we really want a good, a good understanding, because he articulates the heart of the Father. 
If we want to know about the Father God, if we want to know what he's like, we can look at his son, the Lord Jesus, and we gain this insight and understanding. And if we take a look at Jesus in relation to his emotional experience, we see this incredible array of emotional experiences. In Luke, it's recorded where he literally touches a leper. Okay. When I think about the situation and the circumstance of the leper, the only other people he can hang with are lepers. They are shunned. Nobody will have anything to do with them. People don't want anything to do with them. They, they, they flee. And the only people that they're able to be around are other lepers. Can you imagine his experience as a leper to have Jesus come and touch him? If we set aside the emotional significance to this man who maybe for years has not been touched and Jesus touches him and heals him. I believe it's impossible for us to understand the significance of what happens in that exchange if we don't process the emotional component the emotional significance of that event. And Jesus, of course, says, of course, of course, I am willing. And he heals him. So we take a look and we see that Jesus repeatedly, repeatedly is moved by compassion. That is not a head issue. That's not a judgment issue. That's not a decision issue. He is moved by compassion in his heart. It's the reason why he responds. And what does he say to John when the disciple comes and says, you know, are you the one we look for or do we look for somebody else? And Jesus lists, you know, uh, the lame walk, uh, the blind hear, um, the, the blind see, the deaf hear, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Well, why would he say that? Because the poor matter to the heart of the Father. They matter to the heart of the Father. And Jesus mentions them. Of all the things he could have talked about, he mentions the poor. And it's convincing for John that, yes, indeed, Jesus is the Messiah. He is the one. There's this remarkable scene in uh, John chapter 9 where Jesus is with the disciples and they say, so Lord, who sinned this man or, or his parents? And he said, neither. It's for the kingdom of heaven to be demonstrated. And he has the man wash in the pool of Siloam, he comes back and he now can see. This is a man who's been born blind from birth. And it'd be possible for us, again, we can look at this from the, from the Hebrew perspective or the Greek perspective. The Greek perspective is, well, things were, black, th things were just black and now he can see. It's kind of like, this is great. There's been the shift and change. This is really good. Wait a minute. This is a man who was born blind from birth. So he now can see. So Jesus didn't just heal his eyes, didn't just heal the optic nerve, didn't just heal the connections to the brain. Jesus healed his ability literally to interpret what he was seeing. This man was able, by definition, to see three dimensions when he had never experienced that before in his life. That's how thorough the healing was for Jesus with this man. And we take a look again to get, get an idea. So what's motivating Jesus? Remember, the Pharisees were on him all the time. Jesus couldn't go anywhere without being observed and watched by the Pharisees. They were nipping at his heels. They were provoking. They were trying to trick him. They were looking for ways to trap him. They were looking for all, anything that they possibly could do, anything they possibly could do to get him. And Jesus was still undaunted in his motivation uh, with compassion. So here he is, sees this man, heals him, and this man goes before uh, the Pharisees, and they literally badger this guy. They probably badgered him for hours, and his parents are called in. Is this your son? Yeah, he, he's our son. Well, how's, how's he made, how, how, can he see, how can he see? We don't know that. And they step aside the issue. It's kind of, you need to go ask him. He's, he's of age, and because they don't want to deal with the, uh, being in trouble with the Pharisees. So the Pharisees go after this guy. Finally, they throw him out. They throw him out. And so here's Jesus in the midst of all the things he's got going on. And he hears that this man has been thrown out of the synagogue. 
What does Jesus do? He seeks him out to find him. This man's just had his sight restored. And the, the cost of him having his sight restored is he now gets thrown out of the temple, thrown out of the synagogue. And Jesus, with all the other things that are going on, hears that this man has been thrown out. And he goes to find him. And if you look in the scriptures, it's one of the few times that Jesus actually reveals his messiahship to him. You're thinking, what in the world is going on with Jesus that he would literally be moved amongst all the stuff he's got going on and the people that are thronging around him? He hears that this man has had the, the insult and the indignity and the alarming social disgrace and the excommunication that comes He's now a pariah from being thrown out of the synagogue. <clears throat> and Jesus is moved to go find him. Why is it that Jesus weeps over Lazarus? And I contend, and I've said this on numerous occasions in multiple different circumstances, I believe we only cry about the important stuff. And we've got two portions of scripture where Jesus is brought to tears. One with his friend Lazarus. Jesus actually had a friend. I think my sense is that Lazarus knew him, not as Messiah Jesus, but just as just as Jesus, his friend. And 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 Lazarus, he's there and he's about to raise Lazarus from the dead, and he sees the devastation in Mary and in Martha. And I think he's aware of a number of different things. I think he's aware that death is awaiting himself. I think he's aware of somehow he's lost his own father, either to death or desertion, one of the two, and we don't know which. I think Jesus is identifying, emotionally connecting and identifying with this man, Lazarus, and his sisters who were devastated at his loss. And I look at this and I think, okay, Lord, if, if you are representing purely and accurately God the Father, then, then, then God the Father can be heartbroken over things too. That, that gives a whole different dimension to his nature and his character. He's not just all powerful and almighty. He's also all loving and all kind, all pure and all holy and all good. It's what he shows Moses of all the things he could have shown Moses. His might, his power, his ability to kick button, take names, he, all that kind of stuff. He can make volcanoes and earthquakes. He can shake the foundations of the earth. He could have shown all those things to Moses and impressed the heck out of him. What does he show him? He shows Moses his goodness. His goodness. He's like, whoa. So when we look at the scriptures and we see Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. He is, he is in tears. How I've longed to gather you like a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you wouldn't have me. You have missed your day of visitation. The whole of, of Hebraic history has led up to the time when in Jerusalem the Messiah would come, and I am here, and you've missed my day of visitation. That is absolutely phenomenal, absolutely amazing. So, so when we look at the scriptures and when we look at Jesus, when we see him, we get a picture of God the Father. And it is impossible for us to relate to Jesus as Lord and King without being fully aware of the fact and making sure that we don't dismiss the fact that the thing that stands out with Jesus with his heart. If you read through, speed read through the Gospel of Luke and his interactions repeatedly with the Pharisees are specifically around the fact that these men who know the scriptures and who know who God is have no heart at all. They are functionally heartless. That's why Jesus reserves the epithets that he does for them. You whitewash, whitewash walls, you are whitewash sepulchers and uh, inside are dead men's bones. I mean, that's, that's, 
not very complimentary, but he reserves that kind of comment to them because they, ha they have no heart. They are heartless. They're heartless towards the people. They're heartless towards the poor. They're heartless towards the widows and orphans. They're heartless towards them. And it's the whole big deal for Jesus. So if we take a look at the scriptures overall and we recognize that in order to get a really good glimpse of the Lord Jesus, uh, uh, excuse me, to get a really good glimpse of a really good understanding of who the Father is, it's impossible for us to really fully grasp the significance of our Heavenly Father if we ignore the heart that is represented in him, the heart that's represented by him, and the heart that is revealed in his Son, the Lord Jesus. So this, I would suggest, is what the Lord Jesus has called us to. This is the purposeful, intentional, spirit-breathed equipping the saints, which is hearts full, full, full of the love of God, full of the love for God, and full of the love for the people that God loves so deeply, which is believers and non-believers alike. This is the heart of the Father. This is why our emotional experience is so significant. And if I find blocks in my ability to love, that's for me to deal with, with my Heavenly Father and my, and my Lord, the Lord Jesus, and the activity of the Holy Spirit in my heart to change my heart so that I love and live like him. And the purpose he came, this is the intentionality again, for the equipping of the saints, not just for the kingdom's work. He isn't just equipping us with full hearts, full measured hearts, not just for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the kingdom, but he's equipped our hearts and wants our hearts full just for the king himself that our love and affection for the Lord Jesus would know no limitations and no bounds. I believe that's how we really prove that he is our Lord and our Savior. And out of that comes all the proof of the truth of his word, the truth of his affection, the truth of his sacrifice, and the truth of the scriptures. Well, hopefully, my brothers and sisters, there's more to come. Father, thank you for the incredible way that you have demonstrated your love for us. While we were even yet sinners and looking the other way, you sent the Lord Jesus because of your love and affection for us. Father, I thank you that our humanness and our frailty and our mistakes and our stupidity and our ignorance, none of those things deter you in any way in your love and affection for us. Father, I ask that the gap between what we know in our Greek thinking minds of what you said, the love and affection that you say you have, that we can read and we can agree with. Father, I ask there would be no gap between that side of our understanding and what our experience is in our hearts of knowing 100% that you love me, that the Lord Jesus, that the Heavenly Father loves you. No holds barred, no conditions on that. He loves you. Thank you, Father. Continue to teach us in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen for now.